Welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie Paquin, and I am the president and CEO of Points of Light. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Points of Light, you know that for more than 30 years, our mission has been to inspire, equip, and mobilize people to take action that changes the world. The action that we're focused on um, is, uh, has been volunteering. And you'll hear from today's research uh, presentation that volunteering is still considered one of the most influential actions you can take to lead and lend support uh, to those issues that you care about. But what we've come to see also is that the next generation of civic leaders is also solving problems with more tools than volunteerism. The way that people talk about or participate in doing good or creating change has evolved. In 2018, Points of Light was struck by the following data points from CNCS. Now, uh, we, it is known as AmeriCorps. And those data points are 30% of people engaged in formal volunteerism, 62% of people said that they uh, help in other ways, and 90% of those surveyed said that they actually participated in being civically active. People are using their voice, their purchase power, their choice of place of employment and other strategies to express their values and solve global and community issues. This led points of light uh, in our team to expand our thinking and our actions beyond uh, traditional volunteerism. And in 2019, we, unve we unveiled the Points of Light Civic Circle as a framework for engagement. The Civic Circle is about individually and collectively helping people realize that they have agency to create change. Here's a short video introducing the Civic Circle. We believe that the most powerful force of change in our world is the individual who makes a positive difference. The Civic Circle represents a person's power to lead, lend support, and take action for causes they care about. The challenges facing our world are big and the solutions may feel out of reach, leading people to search for inspiration, creativity, and the energy to make change. We know that when people act, they may not assign themselves traditional labels. They may do good through the purchases they make, where they work, or by donating or volunteering. Individual actions, no matter how small, can make an impact. When you combine any of these actions, the Civic Circle is transformational. We believe a person who lives a civic life understands their social responsibility, advocates for a just and fair society, and, ultimately, can be a spark for meaningful change. Whether you vote, share messages about a cause you care about on social media, or use your time and talents to bring resources to an organization working in your community, every action matters. It starts with you. How will you tap into the power of the Civic Circle? In the spring of 2020, we actually conducted research on civic engagement in the US to look into the attitudes, behaviors from everyone, uh, from the silent generation to Generation Z. And I have to pause here to say thank you so much to AT&T for their two-year partnership with, uh, with Points of Light in helping to fund that research. Today's uh, research is a deeper dive into the millennial generation, the largest generation in the country's history. There are 72 millennials ages 26 through 38. And um, they've actually experienced a lot in their uh, short lifetime from 9-11, uh, a financial crisis, a global pandemic. And it is this generation that actually constitutes 75% of our workforce by 2025, or will constitute 75% of our workforce by 2025. It's the generation that's currently raising our youngest generation, Generation Alpha. And for businesses and nonprofits looking to navigate perpetually the unprecedented waters of um, the 2020s, the key to success is understanding this generation and engaging with it successfully. 
Uh, for this research, we actually partnered with our good friend De Derek Feldman and his exceptional team at Influence SG. And when I joined uh, Points of Light four years ago, I have to say in my first 100 days, I was on a listening tour and Derek was one of the individuals that I reached out and he was so gracious with his time and uh, with the research that he was working on at the time. And that research actually in his work um, actually influenced um, our strategy. And so he's an incredibly generous partner who has been thinking about um, and working in the space of millennials and millennial engagement. Um, for the uh, 10 years prior, um, he led the research for the Millennial Impact Project and it produced a very comprehensive uh, Millennial Impact Report that really shows how millennials are engaging. Uh, in addition to his leadership at Influence SG, uh, Derek is Managing Director of Ad Council Edge, uh, the Ad Council Strategic Consulting Division that advises the formative stages of public engagement. Uh, please welcome my friend and our friend, Derek Feldman. Derek, so nice to see you and thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks so much, Natalie. And thank you all for joining today as well. So we're gonna spend about 20 to 30 minutes connecting about the research that we found uh, this sort of last, uh, or this fall, early fall and summer. And uh, as we go through this, of course, there's some really great information here in the presentation, but feel free to uh, access the full report through the Points of Light website overall. Now, as Natalie mentioned, this generation, largest generation overall, something that we've been looking at for quite some time, in addition now to Gen Z, your 18 to 25 year olds uh, as well. But, but for the most part, this generation is in really some of those key decision-making times. Life cycle changes are occurring, right? Dependents are happening for our oldest millennials, our youngest millennials driving into the workforce and into management, making decisions and so forth. So very, very key demographic as we look across sort of this age span of 25 to 40 overall. So we ran our study and we fielded it in June of 28, uh, June 28th to July the 2nd, right before July the 4th. And as you can see here, we were mindful of looking at both race and ethnicity overall. And, and you can definitely look at some of the margin of error and confidence intervals here. But key things here is that we wanted a representative sample of American millennials, people that live in America, millennials in those demographics, and you can see the different racial composition, more on sort of the background and methodological report, uh, approach can be found in the research itself. But I wanna sort of uh, continue and expand a little bit further on Natalie's concept in and around sort of the civic circle. The civic circle truly does represent an opportunity to influence change. And I think that we as organization leaders and company leaders, look at this and say, um, and, and really start it from the position that every individual has assets of value. Now, your organization may not value some of these as much as others, but to the individual themselves, my voice, my dollars, my network, my actions, all of these things add and contribute value towards the social issues that I want to affect. As you see in the civic circle, each of these represents a way for me as an individual, as Natalie said, to express those values, but to influence change in some way. And for some of our organizations, we're the recipients of the actions related to the civic circle. And as we are the recipients of that, there's one thing that's really, really key is that anytime anyone gives you something of value, it is that they expect that you're going to take that value and do good with it and make progress, add value to the issue that you're trying to address, the people you're trying to help overall. So while the civic circle is a conduit through to create action and impact in the eyes of the individual based upon what they value, it's also our responsibility at those who are receivers to help them understand how progress has been made how that individual's asset and the things that they brought to the table, uh, conceptually, virtually, literally, added to what our issue and our people were trying to affect in some way, shape, or form. So the civic circle was something that we brought into this study to make sure that we were looking at it through the lens of the individual's perspective overall. 
Because every individual, and something that we've learned through now more than a decade of looking at both millennials and Gen Z, is, is that the individual is a supporter of social issues. That means that they support it through many different ways that's represented on the civic circle. And it means that they take their actions, which they value, to try to show that support in many meaningful ways. So let's go ahead and dive right into some of the key findings. And of course, just given our time, we're just gonna talk high level about some of the key pieces so that you have an understanding of that. And then Natalie's gonna join me later on. We'll have a, a little bit of dialogue about that. And I hope that you will enter some of your, your questions and comments into the chat and Q and A because we'll wanna get to those a little bit later as well. So one of the first key findings is always trying to understand what issues are of most importance. Now, as Natalie mentioned, this generation has been going through a considerable amount as well as, as, as we all have been too. And so when we think though about the issues of most interest right now, they tend to be very personal. Some of the key things that they're going through both in their life and sort of as researchers, we call this sort of life cycle changes, things that are happening to our dependents, to our families, to the places where we live, work and play. And as we look at that, some of the, some of the things that are affecting us or at least of interest, are affecting millennials for the first time as well, right? We have our youngest millennials getting into the workforce, employment issues potentially, health and healthcare potentially as those that have growing families and so on. So it's no surprise as we kind of look at some of these issues. And while this paragraph here kind of gives you some data points, I think it's important to just look at it from this slide here, which will show you the different uh, different main issues overall that rose to the top. These are your top six overall. Now we had a laundry list of issues that we often ask and something that we consistently monitor, not just in this piece, but in, in other means. And I will say two key things here is, is that while on here, you see things like COVID and some health related pieces, employment and wages, and all of those kinds of things that relate to increasing uh, employment, jobs, skills, and creation. Note that actually racial and social justice was not that far behind. And when you dive deeper into some of these issues, you look at some of the open-ended response pieces and you find that each of these has a layer of race or social justice also embedded within them as a topic to address too. So while it wasn't necessarily in its top by itself independent, it was connected to each of these issues that you see on the screen. Again, a lot of these issues are things that they're personally dealing with and stuff that we've heard in some of the open-ended responses as well. So as millennials are going through these major life cycle changes, and some of them obviously have families on the older end and management and so forth, they're dealing with these issues personally too. Now, we also wanted to try to understand if I had to create a persona, a profile of those individuals that are civically active, what would that persona be? And so Natalie and the team asked us like, if you had to describe it, and so we went back to the data and this is what we discovered. If we were looking at sort of the white millennial category, you'll see that on the screen here, two key things, greater than 100,000 and uh, HHI or annual earnings overall, you'll see the key issues there too tends to be works full time, married, and a male, actually 35 to 40. On the BIPOC side, um, lower, lower 25 to 29, less than 50,000. And you'll see some of the differences between religious attendance and also those issues overall. Now, where this was a little bit interesting is historically in some of our past millennial impact reports that Natalie had talked about, we had actually seen females be more in the dominant category here in the profile than we have here in the male side. So something different and unique than what we've seen in past studies on the generation overall. So that brings us to our second category, our second finding. Now, while there's areas of interest, doesn't necessarily mean somebody acts on those areas of interest. And that's very, very key because once you start to dive deeper into asking around actions and performance, and especially around the civic circle, what one says versus what one does is sometimes a little bit different. And that's what we see too here is the case. And actually, if they performed at least an action in the last year, and we looked at it both in the last year and 30 days from the time that we fielded this in the late summer, you're going to see the sort of top issues uh, overall right there. Now, keep in mind that was also fielded in and around Pride Month. So we do make that notation in the report as well. 
Um, but historically, sexual orientation, gender identity issues has been towards the top in general and other studies that we have looked at too. So overall, something to think about as you uh, are leading organizations and looking at issues that millennials are dealing with versus the ones that they're taking actions on. Oftentimes we see this discrepancy happen when they may not have been presented with call to actions and opportunities to actually take action on the issues of interest. That does happen from time to time. Media narratives, cultural, social, economic conditions locally tend to move sometimes our actions towards some things in different ways in the moment as well. And then of course, there's always peer leverage. The things that are happening in our workforces, in our, work, in our workplaces, things that happen in, within our neighborhoods and so forth that tend to challenge sort of our interest versus our actual behaviors that happen overall. So not to necessarily say that it's a, it's a surprise, but rather it's consistent sometimes with what we see from our desire versus the things we tend to work on as well. Our next finding is around what did, you know, millennials, when they're looking at engaging in these issues, remember we've got that civic circle overall, how did these individuals, how did these individuals perform some of those actions as well? And so when you see some of these actions, I'm gonna take the top five issues, right? So if you saw earlier, so we've got COVID and mental health, climate change, healthcare premiums and civil rights. Um, then you look at time spent on these overall. And as you'll see, the time spent on learning, using social media to share and promote, changing purchasing and uh, uh, behaviors based upon a company's engagement or not in a social issue, as well as donations overall, were ones that were tracked in the highest categories in each one of these. Now, what's interesting to note is as you look at COVID, mental health, climate, healthcare, and civil rights, one of the key pieces that we had seen is, is around spending time learning about that issue, being more knowledgeable in and around the effects, importance of, or even the other side of those uh, as well. And so what's really, really key here and that's consistent is spending the time learning about those issues is a very key piece for sort of as we look at our efforts as nonprofits to either change or build up knowledge, attitude, and behaviors towards our issues and beneficiaries and building constituencies, as well as either companies that partake in social issue campaigns as well. So for you, this is a really, really great opportunity to see that one of your primary roles should be is to help people as they seek out information, especially on some of these core topics, to provide that information to help them become more knowledgeable. So then breaking it down even further, when we're looking at those individuals that spend time learning about social issues, we started to look at what, what does that person look like and what kind of attributes do they have? And you'll see that on the screen right now. They're the older millennial male and married, four-year degree, makes a little bit more than 50,000. And these are some of their top issues overall. Again, this is an actual sort of a, a surprising piece because in our past studies, overall, we would have seen sort of the female side be higher here than the male. So very interesting categorically that we've seen in sort of a gender difference that we had as well. I wanna highlight specifically one action in particular, which is around volunteering and what we had seen over the course of the pandemic from this sample overall. It was strong and still seen as very influential. You'll see on the screen on the top circle, sort of did they volunteer online or virtually? And 66% of the sample had. And then as you look, sort of did they volunteer, do you plan to continue in that same capacity with what you've already done? And nearly 80% said yes. And so some pretty good indications that there's online or an online interest, obviously, in, in virtual volunteering, but also maintaining the pace in which that they were volunteering too. As we look on the next slide, I, I sort of break it down a little bit further and sort of looking at the actions you've taken in support of social issues and causes. So we wanted to understand, given these issues that are so important to you, what do you think is the most important as part of that civic circle? What is the most important thing on there within the civic circle that you think can have the most influence, have the most impact overall? And when you see it here on COVID, it was volunteering. Civil rights was actually changing purchasing habits at 
Mental health was volunteering and supporting their peers and fellow family and friends at 86%. Looking at employment, participating in actually marches and rallies, sort of the jobs area as well. That was, the, that was the, one of the top key pieces only in that category of the issue. And then lastly, working or contributing financially to those organizations working on healthcare or health premium issues uh, in the United States. So top responses as the most influential, very influential overall, basically, as you see there, volunteering continues to be influential with some of our key health issues for sure. And our next finding, let's look at sort of the uncertainty that kind of kept around some of millennials from taking action. So why didn't you, right? So we highlighted to now all of those individuals that took action. So now we're gonna look at those that didn't and why. And not completely surprising here, right? Because a lot of this relates to COVID pieces. Financial ability was obviously the top there, but as you look at the rest of these, Obviously, they tend to be in and around the COVID pieces. Now, that last one, unfortunately, I would rather be doing other things in my free time. Well, I guess we can't satisfy everybody, but maybe this is the opportunity for us all here to change that. But doing good, obviously, is advantageous for both themselves and community. So, but just keep this in mind is that hesitations still exist in and around, and this was late summer, hesitations still exist around the categories of actions and participation due to COVID. In another finding, about a half of millennials overall believe that more than ever civic engagement is pretty key. And we wanted to get attitudinal data. So we asked a lot of different sort of scaled levels of attitudes sort of Likert scale style questions where we gave them lots of different statements to react to, to try to see where they, where they are. Now, keep in mind that the vast majority of the people that take you know, the survey here this is a one-time instance, and sometimes those attitudes can shift. But I think what's very, very key to note, as you'll see here, is that the pandemic did change the way people view sort of community, civic engagement, and helping others, sort of that support for social issues. As you'll see here, the pandemic made them think more about it than ever before. Again, some of these millennials are dealing with these issues firsthand, sometimes for the first time ever. And the last thing, as you see there, is about 38% have always thought it was important to get involved and try to make a difference. While that might seem low, 38, all the other major responses were quite much lower than that and sort of positive attitudinally overall. So I think a big takeaway for you as you think here is, is that there is this sort of newer reflection time going on. COVID has exposed sort of the, what is happening in our communities, our health, our viability, some of the other social issues over the course of the last year, year and a half, specifically uh, related to social justice and racial justice as well. So we have a really good reflection time happening right now about involvement. Couple that with the other data points about learning about these opportunities and issues. We definitely have a key, uh, key place here for you as a leader to try to engage more in educational opportunities for this population as expressed through our samples here. And as you see here overall, um, the highlight is, is that white urban males actually, the older millennial side, that 35 to 40, they were the most likely to volunteer in the post pandemic because we were trying to understand who's ready, willing to kind of get going. Now, obviously it's sort of hard to say now we're in a post pandemic period, I think, we're all in this odd stage of where we are in the pandemic, but can say that is, is that this population when looking at the data primarily was interested in sort of continuing on and accelerating their volunteers and engagement. I also share with you on here right now, some other key attributes. You can kind of see where males were, white ages and urban versus rural and suburban. So really, really good opportunities when we look at the engagement side. Our next finding is in and around companies and how active and involved they should be with social issues um, by far. And I think what's really an interesting to note is how we ask these questions. So I work on another data set called the Corporate Social Mind, where we look at consumer attitudes towards companies that engage in social issues, political issues, and so forth. Everything from volunteerism using their platform and so on. 
And we delve a little further deeper with this sample to understand what they do from a consumer mindset to look at how those companies are engaging or not in social issues. First and foremost, if you look at the question here that we asked is specifically around racial equity and social justice and anti-discrimination, that very often to somewhat often, you can see how big that category really is. Basically, this tells us that a large swath of our cohort of our sample is going to corporate websites to understand where they are on racial equity and social justice issues. It's even more predominant as you see in those categories that are broken down lower there, Black Americans, those earning 100,000 or more, urban, male, Hispanic, and rural. So you can see the differences among the various categories and demographic profile as we see. So what does this tell us? This is that the public and primarily millennials from our study are very interested to try to understand where the company is standing on these very, very important issues. When we look at what millennials want the country to address after the pandemic. So this is something that we are looking at from an administration, government, as well as potentially causes overall. Sort of where do you, where do you think we need to address certain areas? And as you see here, healthcare, criminal social justice, education, and the environment and climate overall were there. The top issues, as you can see, based upon those categories and percentages are there. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that as you see this, and I mentioned earlier, a lot of these issues tend to be very, uh, very personal, ones that we're being affected by too. Well, the environment is one of those as well, right? From the effects of climate change and so forth. Now, as we looked at when this was fielded, of course, there were, this was fielded during time where we had floods and some other things happening or just coming right out of those situations. So we do note that in the report too. But as we look at sort of these social issues overall addressing after the pandemic, these might be great opportunities, especially if you're in and around these areas to really help educate and inform this, this generation of ways to become active through that civic circle as well. So that kind of brings us to sort of my reflection a little bit on sort of the role of the civic circle as we see through the data. And of course, there's so much more data to have in there and, and we would spend two hours on a webinar and I'm sure you don't have enough time for that, but make sure you look at the report. And I think Jenny and the team have put that in the, in the chat for you. Is, is that, we know these issues are very personal and that we have to create a journey for individuals to learn and understand, take action and see how those actions help make progress towards the issues. That's our job as leaders representing the causes that are working on the, on the issues that they care about. We also have to help them understand the myriad of opportunities that exist for one to make change possible. We might often lead with volunteerism. We might lead with donation. We might lead at times with activism or purchasing power and so forth, or voting civically as well. We have all of these unique opportunities that a person can bring value to the issue through your organization and through your company. The goal is, is to present those opportunities as ways to make a difference, not for you, but with you for the people that you're trying to help. They see you through the civic circle as conduits to create and effect change. And that's something that the data really, really speaks to. Natalie mentioned that we see many different ways in which that somebody wants to bring that value that they hold and bring it towards those social issues. There is no primary way per se of one action or the other because a supporter today means that they supported social issues through many of those different actions like that's represented on the civic circle. The goal is, is to help them understand all of those different avenues and show them that anytime they participate through the civic circle and through your organization, that progress is being made. And as I always joke, you know, we love the word impact. We love the word impact. And while some wanna truly have an impact, of course, they just wanna know if they give you something of value, that progress was made. 
that's your job to help them understand that through the civic circle and through your organization, that was possible. So where do we leave from here? Sort of a key takeaway for companies is to realize that the platforms that they obviously sit on and have an opportunity with suppliers and vendors and you know, all different kinds of millennials who are likely representative of their employee bases and their partner bases and so forth. Yes, it is true. Millennials are looking at the social issues that they're participating in. And yes, it's true that they are influenced by the behaviors in which companies and the stances that they have and take. But the real call to action here is companies also are you know, really trusted messengers at times. They can help that learning opportunity. We know that millennials are seeking more information on these issues and topics that are greatly affecting them and their neighbors and their peers and their family members. This is a time to lean into that and to help them understand with some great trusted messenger content, with accuracy and transparency, stuff that's happening. Be another conduit to inform, especially with an audience that's really eager to learn. The next one is for us as causes and nonprofits overall. We have this opportunity to present so many more opportunities to create change together. You know, the, these individuals, millennials in our sample, and all of the ones that we have studied through the years, see themselves as co-conspirators with you. They see themselves not working for you, they're working with you together to affect something that they care about as well. And so present it that way. Help them see together that we'll, you have a journey that's set out to help to create change, and they can participate in that journey and make it their own illustrate all the different ways in which that somebody can truly take action through the civic circle and help them realize that no matter what action they take, it adds value to the work that's being done for the people you're trying to address. That is so, so key. It feels really good when you realize anything you contributed that you personally felt was valuable, somebody recognized as well. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that time. I know it was so quick to go through, but there's a lot of questions, of course, that we want to address. And I think I'm going to bring in my colleague, Natalie, back so we can walk through some of those. Yeah, hey, Derek, uh, thank you. So exciting and really appreciate your uh, long-term partnership and friendship. We got quite a few um, questions that have come in. And the first one, I think, is just the housekeeping, which was um, earlier uh, asked, which is um, how many people were um, surveyed uh, as a part of this research? Yeah, the sample N was around 1,500. Well, actually, I it's 1,500 with the general sample. We oversampled with a little bit more Asian American Pacific Islanders. So that included another uh, 80, which gets us to a roughly around 1,600. Okay, perfect. Great. Thanks for that. And, um, and then we have uh, quite a few questions that are around um, their intergenerational, right? And so uh, there was one question that came in from Patty and she said, hey, what traits uh, do you find in common between the generations, let's just say boomers and Z? And are we destined to think that uh, there's always going to be differences between these groups and uh, there's, there's nothing similar in terms of their approach? Fantastic question. I, you know, I remember 12, 14 years ago when we started the Millennial Impact Project with the Case Foundation, people would say, are they just that different? And I'm like, well, maybe, you know, and I think that for a lot of us, we get um, enamored or surrounded by the way one takes action versus the fundamental why behind it. Um, I always say that um, our actions are based, and then Natalie, you reinforced at the beginning, are based upon beliefs and values. You can be 85 living in Omaha, Nebraska, and believe that social justice needs to be addressed. You can be 18 in Atlanta and believe that social justice needs to be addressed. Our beliefs and values, if we lead with that, that is the thing that unites the community of intergenerational around us. How one performs an action should not persuade us to determine the differences, but rather the preference in the moment. You know, even if the 18 year old decides to come out to the next march and rally or use TikTok to create their own video addressing social justice, it doesn't change the 80 year old's belief in the, you know, it still has that connection that exists between that 80 year old and that 18 year old. 
And so I find that boomers and Gen Z, there's actually a lot of commonality when it comes down to the belief and value systems that we tend to have. But the way we express that tends to be different. And that is going to happen because of the social and cultural norms that this generation has that boomers, you know, and, and by the way, older generations were saying the same thing about you boomers. I hate to tell you that as we talk about Gen Z and younger overall, but but if you stay with the notion that we need to lead with belief and value because anyone, regardless of age or identity, should be able to take an action through us and with us, then you create, then you have a different mindset shift away from saying we're for a young or old, but rather we're for those that believe in this. Perfect, great, thanks. And then we have a couple of questions from, um, from Megan. Uh, which is about um, working across generations to create social change. Like, was there a question about like how we would do that? Unfortunately, in this study, we did not. However, I would say is that um, kind of continuing this, the, the last piece that I talked about is, is that one of the best, uh, and we worked with an organization in the West Coast once that wanted to test intergenerational um, social change actions and engagement. And, one of the best things you can ever do is highlight the myriad of faces and people that believe in an issue together. Because when you're with community, people that believe in the same thing, it is so reinvigorating. Like just, if you're a social issue researcher and observer, you can just see the energy happen regardless of age and so forth. And what we discovered is, is the more we can build community together by having them perform actions together, be present with one another, create places where they listen to one another, that actually, I mean, the, the participation effects later on have always increased. So while we didn't get into that study, we, there is some really good knowledge around that that exists. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, he, here's a, a, another one from uh, Megan, and uh, this is, I, I think, really important. Um, she says, look, a great deal of uh, information has been written about the burden on women, child care, employment, homeschooling, and how difficult it's been during the pandemic. Uh, do we have a sense of um, whether or not this increased uh, burden on, uh, on women or the family uh, have influenced these uh, results? Megan, were you in our meeting internally? Um, so <laughs> as soon as it came out, um, Dr. Amy Thayer, who leads the research with me, she said, I wonder if this, and we had the same question. And unfortunately, sometimes when you do research, you just get about 100 more questions that you want to ask the next time. But I'll say this from what we know about life cycle changes, employment, and so on. If you look at the long-term trajectory of how an individual engages socially and civically, it tends to be like this. It goes up and down, but it, it goes up. It, it is on this track to go up. Those downward ebbs and flows occur when we as an individual are going through life cycle or personal professional situations. It has nothing to do with what the organization did or so forth. And we know actually that there are, at least in our studies in the past, that there are about four of those that we track and monitor consistently that pull one's civic participation lower in times. One of them is, is dependence. The second time is, is that not when they get their first jobs, but actually when they start managing people, you have a whole new perspective and you start to also work up the ladder, you, young performing leaders as well. You're completely and utterly financially independent as well. And then lastly is, is that the individual has sort of had more experiences with other um, travel and cultural social experiences in and around the cities and the environments in which that they live. So while I can't give you the definitive answer, uh, a hypothesis I have is, is that yes, that is true. And I think that's reflected in some of the profiles. That's my hypothesis. And I think that you know, as we sort of see where we go from here, that the law will go back to where we were. Perfect. Um, then I think this is a clarifying question. We have one attendee that says, hey, I'm a little confused. Are we saying that the average millennial that is volunteering is a Caucasian male? Yeah, so it was an interesting one. So um, what we did is that we looked at all of the individuals who were volunteering and trying to develop the profile of those. The dominant attributes 
in the demographic and ethnic racial profile of those individuals. So that came out to be more white male than, well, male and then white as a separate category. But yes, in this case. Now, using the word average would be a little hard because from a research perspective, we wouldn't say average per se, we would say the dominant profile attribute that was contributed to this particular question in general. In addition to that, I would say is that that was for the sample in this moment. And it'd be interesting, and as this is really connected to the last one that Megan asked about, is, is that I wonder where we are now and where we will be at the end of the year. That was primarily in the summer time frame and so forth. There's some other researchers, colleagues of ours, that are working on various gender, um, both uh, gender and non-binary research, looking at the ebbs and flows of civic participation right now. And it's interesting, they're getting fluctuations as much as we are. Hypothesis, again, might be in and around all of those two as well. Um, perfect. I do have one, uh, uh, an additional question, and this was around the elements of um, the civic circle. And, um, you know, was there anything that surprised you in terms of um, which aspect of the framework um, people were most interested in? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think um, for us right now, we tend to see contributions a little bit lower, um, his, you know, over the last year to two years. And in fact, we just released um, our causes, social interest, our 18 to 30 year old study recently to this week on climate and so forth. And when you look at the actions there, it's all stakeholder using one's voice and so forth. Um, over the course of the last year and the two years, given where we are in some of our social issues and what people are seeing as more influential, using one's voice and getting themselves out there is by far being the most preferential and what the person perceives as being the most influential. Because some of that stuff is happening in real time as we speak, right? It's it's you know, the leverage brought to companies or brought to government stakeholders and so forth to try to address social political issues that currently exist. So some of that's a little bit of a cue. It doesn't necessarily mean that person has participated in that way, but they see others or you get modeling behavior environments where it's like, oh, I see everybody marching and rallying. I think that's, and then all of a sudden they hear a change occurred. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, from that perspective as well. But for me, I, you know, I think one of the most surprising pieces is the amount of knowledge gain, you know, the knowledge piece, learning overall. It is just a, an opportunity for causes to get themselves, nonprofits to really get themselves out there and help to be more informative in this moment as well. Now that takes some creative com you know, communications and it takes some creative ways to do that, to break through. But it's clear that we have even when you look at those that were trying to understand what companies were doing, it's this, I wanna go learn what's happening here. I want to go learn about this issue and so forth. So we're at a unique time where it's some of these issues, people are trying to get an understanding of them, potentially to take action. And that's where it's, how do we inform and then incite action from that information? Yeah, thanks. That, I, I think that's uh, quite insightful uh, for us as well. Uh, you know, when we originally created the framework, it had eight icons of civic engagement and the icon around listening and learning uh, actually um, was brought to us by um, leaders within our network uh, who were, you know, um, listening to people who were in community and, and we understood that that was a very important way to, um, to engage. So, um, so thank you for that. Yeah, and I think too, Natalie, I just want to say one more thing. Um, recently, we've been in the field doing a lot of qualitative and ethnography pieces. This is a pure quant exercise at this point. Um, but in our other studies, doing a lot of qual and environments is that when you, when you start to understand why somebody is used taking certain actions, you start, in, you know, you start going back from, um, this is what you did. I need to get back in the mindset as to how you got to this, got to this, this point. And as you look at those things, um, one of the things that we often hear and see in the early end is, I've been, try I've been trying to figure out a way to use my voice impactfully, or I never knew this was really going on. So therefore I was doing the inactive piece. Or lastly is, is that 
I've been trying for people to listen to me, but no one is hearing. And finally, this incident happened where it's like, here is what I've been talking about for so long in general. So while we are looking at learning, there's this aspect of listening as well that is very, very key. And you know, to your point, Natalie, of doing listening in communities across the country, you find that some of the things that have happened over the last two years have sparked a sort of, yeah, I've been thinking this, or this has been happening. I've been trying to raise my voice about it. And it took these incidents for it to occur. Yes, um, so so interesting. Thank you. Uh, we we understand that around behavior change, there's awareness, education, and then a call to action to really get people um, engaged. Um, there's one question that came in. Actually, two questions. They are a little similar, and uh, one was about the messaging. Um, did we get into any indicators around messaging for getting people more involved in volunteering or um, civic engagement? We didn't test messaging, um, although that would be the next step, right? So um, a great encouragement there. Um, we do know based upon other sort of messaging that usually anytime, and this is from other studies that we have done in the past, um, specifically through the Millennial Impact Project and so forth, if we lead with, if we lead with components related to belief narratives, it tends to be better than the CTA request usually at the front end. So that would be things like, you know, we believe every child should have this or a family that stays together heals together, you know, those kinds of narratives leading with the belief narrative has historically kept engagement into the CTA that whatever that call to action is stronger. But for this particular study, we have not. Mm, great. Now here's, I think, an excellent, well, they're all excellent questions, but here's, <laughs> here's an excellent question because, you know, a part of um, uh, points of light aspiration is to remove barriers, um, create a world where it's easy for people to lean in and um, where no one's on the sideline. And so this question is, how does the research profile um, show that, that there are barriers to other civic engagement? Um, and I just want to make sure I got it. How does the research profile show that I think there are um, barriers to yeah. engagement? Yeah. Yeah. And what can we do to reduce barriers uh, for civic engagement? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's an interesting one because oftentimes when we are, um, <laughs> we'll get somebody that says, you know, we sent this request out and nobody reacted. And we're like, all right, well, let's examine it. Then you get like, is it the message? Was it the CTA? Was it the offering? Was it the opportunity? You kind of go through this whole line during the data part to try to understand it. You know, it already goes without being said that the vast majority of the general population doesn't start with a high expectation, high responsible piece. You have to understand that the brain is an economic system constantly. We perform, we love in our heads to do the least to get the most, right? It's like, okay, I want to go over there. Waze is going to tell me the fastest route to try to do it, right? It's always an economic. It's like, how do I lose weight and not exercise, right? It's like all these kinds of things. Well, in the civic space, it's true. When somebody hears a message or sees an image, their brain isn't saying, you know what you need to do? You need to get on their board and you need to do that for the next two years. What the brain is saying is, this is wrong. Stand up and, and let it be known that this is wrong first. And so that's why you see young people consistently in social platforms, right? It's like, this is wrong or this is incorrect or I'm liking or like that form, by the way, and this is psychologically piece I wrote in, in um, my social movements book around how we start the process because we, something has to either support or conflict with our identity and our value system. But the brain isn't immediately going to, you're gonna go attend the march and rally. The brain gets itself up to that point in general. So the first part of the journey is to help somebody who identifies with a common value and common belief feel like they're not alone. It has nothing, it is all about themselves feeling like we are there, that there are other people that believe like me. And that might be as simply saying, you know, if you believe in the same thing, raise your voice today and commit personally to it and hear all the other people that committed with you. While that might not be a meaningful action yet on your side, it's incredibly personally meaningful for the individual. 
then the next step is most likely asking them to perform some sort of action in which that they feel comfortable sharing with others this identity that exists or the challenge and so forth. And then from there, we get into deeper levels like volunteerism and so forth and gradually building it from there. But it's our job first to help the person feel like they are part of a community of other people that believe the same thing. That's so, so key. That's part of that learning journey, right? Once you learn, it's like, what do you do after that? I, this hits my identity, the values and beliefs that I have. I wanna know who else is out there in general. And because we're social human beings, we wanna know that we're not alone when it comes to this issue. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, there's there's a question uh, about, and I'll take this question, will there be a follow-up survey? Uh, it's our intent to continue to research this, um, this issue. Again, we're very um, thankful for our partner um, for the past couple of years, uh, AT&T, who supported um, this research. But yes, there is intent by um, Points of Light to continue to um, learn more about civic engagement and uh, inspire and equip um, and mobilize people to take action. So uh, this is uh, core to what we do. Um, another question. Uh, yeah, I think my question, um, uh, oh, here's a question that was about millennials and having um, children. I think you kind of uh, responded to that, uh, whether or not um, child care impacted women's ability to, um, to be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, like I said, I think it's a hypothesis that's worth exploring continually from here. I think that there are other, you know, there's other hypotheses that we have to look at in terms of barriers, personally, professionally, socially, culturally, and economically. Things like long call COVID, other healthcare issues, racial justice, economic mobility, um, you know, as we were talking about here, women versus men and, and what has happened over the last year to two years and so forth. Now, one of the areas and spaces to also potentially, as you look into things is determining whether or not, you know, how, how we connect with other policies as well. And sometimes you get into that and sometimes you don't, but, but those are the primary social, cultural, economic barriers and challenges to look at. You usually develop those hypotheses and start to test those consistently going forward. So I think that's a great next, uh, next step for sure. And then uh, uh, my question is about, you know, you've spent so many years uh, learning and studying uh, this population. Um, what are your key, the, the key insights just when you compare what you learned uh, you know, at the beginning of your research 10 years ago to, um, to this? Yeah, we're in an interesting phase of us as causes and organizations and brands and companies. Um, you know, if you looked at, I, I remember, this is, this is funny, our first report, we always like to go back to it and look at, and it's a, it is hilarious to read it through. Um, I mean, we were talking about Facebook early on and, and this stuff and kind of like where we are right now on the topic of Facebook in general. But, you know, it's an interesting time. I think two things have occurred in the course of the last three years and COVID has really kind of pushed forward with a couple of these. The first one being is that when we came out early on saying that people are supporters, they don't define themselves by the actions they take. Like, I'm not a volunteer, I'm not a donor. I'm a supporter of this issue. I happen to volunteer and I happen to donate. I happen to be a voter who supports that issue by voting at the ballot that way. You know, everything in the civic circle. In that supporter mentality, you're shifting away from thinking of people in the performance measurement side of how they relate to us versus looking at them from an asset-based opportunity. And that means our whole constituencies. And millennials from the beginning always took that point. People early on in our studies would say, I can't focus on them because they don't have any money. And I'm like, they have, they are not, you know, to them, they have so many other things of value. They're not thinking about their involvement the way you think about their involvement in general. So we've had a cultural shift. And I think now this data continues to reinforce that I am a supporter who has so many different ways to influence change. And financial dollars is one, but it's not my only one. And I have so many other things to do. I think the second thing too is with that also brings a challenge for all of us here. And that is, is 
maintaining a relationship so that one sees value through you. Because right now, realistically, if you or I, Natalie, wanted to go affect change real quick, I know you would go through every organization, but we don't necessarily have to do that, right? If I wanted to help somebody, it, I could do that with or without causes, with or without companies and so forth. But causes and companies, our organizations have so much better ways in which that we can be more impactful and make progress towards the issue, right? But sometimes our generations and our people don't see that because we are in an instant, instantaneous environment. We see ourselves being pulled by a narrative and a message and reacting to it. And I think when you see this data here, and one of the things that I'll hear when people say, I don't see my cause in that group, my, my issue I'm working on isn't in the top five and so forth. I would never look at that negatively per se. I would look at it and say, what are we doing ourselves so that people look at us to go through us to affect change on this topic? Are we aligned with there to show the myriad of ways one can take action? Are we really, really doing that? And what I find is that it's not a relevance issue, it's are we being showcasing a space and place for people to make change possible through. And I find once you start shifting your thinking and mindset on both how we believe in the way we take actions, like from a supporter, and the fact that I need to create value during the journey of impact for other people, not that people need to do it for me, will realize that this mind shift from where millennials were and we're likely Gen Z, and we already know that from the 18 to 30 year old data we have, is that it's just gonna to continue to be reinforced because there will be more tools, there will be more tactics to do good, yes. with or without you. So um, one last quick question, and then we're gonna wrap up, which is uh, the best platform to um, communicate with uh, millennials? Is it emails, is it texting, is it phone? Uh, any insights on uh, what's the best way to reach this population? Um, we tend to see the highest rates of reaction for our younger millennials with text and social um, in certain platforms. Our older millennials, email is pretty good too. Okay. All right. How old is old? But that's okay. <laughs> 35 to 40 in this sample, Natalie. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, um, uh, first of all, thank you, Derek, again, for, um, for joining us. And, uh, and thank you for your partnership, uh, for your expertise. Really? For your friendship and always, um, you know, leaning in to share good information uh, with us and with the public. And I would say thank you to all of you who um, joined us. We had hundreds uh, register and um, quite a few that showed up today. So thank you for um, for this last um, hour. And again, uh, to our audience, <clears throat> if you would like uh, to see um, the research, uh, please visit our website at pointsolight.org/slash civic engagement. Um, hyphen research and uh, it's available to you. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, have a great day.